What's up, my mages? Arena Craft returns this week to discuss more Kaldheim spoilers. So this is a continuation of an episode that we started earlier in the week. If you have not listened to that previous episode, I would highly recommend you go and do that first and then come back here. If you are in the cool club and you've already done that, then listen on and enjoy. This next card is one of our first snow payoffs, and I think this card is, has interesting implications for mono red specifically. Frostbite, one red mana for a snow instant at common. Frostbite deals two damage to target creature or planeswalker. If you control three or more snow permanents, it deals three damage instead. So I think the first thing that we're thinking about is that you probably want to play this card in a deck in which pretty much all the lands are snow. Um, otherwise, I think it's a little bit slow and a lot worse than shock. I think if your deck, if you are playing mono red with like 20 to 24 snow covered mountains, I think that this deck becomes, uh, this card becomes quite powerful. So that's kind of my read on it. What do you think? I think that there is no way in the world that you give up on Castle Embreath and Shatter Skull Smashing to get a three damage spell on turn three that doesn't go face. I totally agree with you. I think this card's bad. Does okay, so does Castle Embreath not work with the snow covered lands then? I mean it enters the battlefield untapped, but you said all snow lands or close to all snow lands, so if you draw Two Castle Embers and two Mountains. Yeah, that doesn't see, get you your three damage. That's the problem, right? Is that mm -hmm. like I just don't think this card's playable outside of a deck which is pretty much all snow. And there's a lot better lands to run than snow lands, which is yeah. one of the reasons I'm not scared of a little bit of a snow land. So I think this card becomes more playable if our other snow payoffs are worth it. True. 100%. In the world in which you are incentivized enough to play a snow deck, like a one mana bolt that only hits, you know, that doesn't go face is still extremely strong. So, you know, so in the snow deck, I think this card is very good. I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't get played. If it does, I do think it, there must be such a payoff that people are running on mostly or all snow land deck. So yeah. I'm not a buyer. Uh, I'll go on the record as saying I don't think this is good. Could be wrong with some more reveals so i think that you should read this card for us because it's quite an interesting one three blue blue for a legendary creature god mythic one one do you want to read I'll the name to, of it i'll run to the god of the cosmos <laughs> uh, the god of the freaking cosmos is a one one no booty no arms just unbelievable. Anyway, I'll run to gets plus one plus one for each card in your hand and each foretold card you own in exile. And at the beginning of your end step, choose a card type, then reveal the top two cards of your library. Put all cards of the chosen type into your hand and the rest on the bottom in any order. But wait, there's more. It's also a flip card, which will help us understand what the heck a foretold is. No, it doesn't actually. So, so Foretold is a new ability here in the set that says you may pay this cost. I believe it's always two, but you exile the card face down in the Foretold zone to go with the Adventure zone, the Command zone, and any other zones you may need in your life. But the Foretold zone is a place where you send things to exile face down. You can look at it. Opponents cannot. And then because you put it in the Foretold zone, you may play it at a future time uh, for the cost a special foretold cost that's on the card. I also understand that foretold is a sorcery, so you have I, to do it at sorcery speed. I I don't think that's actually true. I think that it, oh okay. I think that would be it nice. just says on your turn. Yep. On your turn. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's what I was. Okay. Yeah. That's that makes sense. But it's still yeah. It's close to. It's a relevant distinction. I think mostly if you're leaving something up for the end of your turn and maybe your opponent doesn't do something, then you can do it at instant speed if you mm. want. I don't think it's going to come up that often, but it is good to know. Here's another example of why it might be relevant. Let's say that you are going to have to 
like discard to hand size, or let's say that you, there's some kind of discard on upkeep, right? Something like that. But it, it could come up for sure. Okay. And then uh, back to the Alrund God of Cosmos. There's another side to the Alrund God of Cosmos. Uh, this is the DFC optional side, which is Haka the Whispering Raven, a legendary creature bird for one in a blue. This is a flying 2-3, and whenever Haka Whispering Raven deals combat damage to a player, return it to its owner's hand and scry 2. Why don't we talk about the Whispering Raven first, because it's a little simpler on the other side. Sure. This is what I'm imagining play design had in mind for this card, is that it blocks against aggro, and then against a more controlling deck, it lets you like set up your land drops and use your mana in the early turns of the game where sometimes not that much is going on so that that's Mm -hmm. kind of how i interpret this card yeah i i fully agree but it does play with the other side yeah so that's true yeah so the pattern if you have one of these and you have the whispering raven down and not summoning six and five mana then you attack with the raven Uh, i see what you're doing you scry two to set up the top of your deck so you know what it is. You yeah. return the raven to your hand. Then you cast the god of the cosmos. And then at the beginning of your end step, you choose the card type that you know is on top of your deck from the scry. You reveal the top two cards. If you're winner, winner, chicken, dinner, they both have the same type, right? And then you put those cards into your hand so it's not as risky and you actually hit with your all run. So it plays with itself. It, it's pretty cool. I think that Alrin's second ability is very strong regardless. It's especially good for continuing to hit your land drops. It's a pretty safe bet, even if you don't know what the top of your library is, to just name land, and then you may get up to two lands put into your hand, which I think is pretty gas. Oh, man. What if you miss, though, and put two spells on the bottom? The feels bad might be too much for the average mage. That is pretty rough. And of course, like... You know, as control mages are so often doing, if if you really need that shatter this guy, and then you manage mm-hmm. to screw it up because of your all run, that's gonna feel bad as well. It's hard for me to imagine a deck that's really in for the front side, for the all run side of the card. So I'm curious if you've come up with any kind of scenarios or builds that you think are going to justify it so an example that I would start with is a blue red spells deck that runs a lot of instants. And because, like, I don't know, you want to run the spell lands so that you can hit lands while naming sorcery or instant, um, like instant, I suppose, in this case. Uh, it's going to be hard to maximize, I think, the the front side of the card just based on deck construction because I don't think there's enough cards of one type. Like, Umori isn't easily slotting in these days. Um, so I think that you have to be able to have some knowledge of, over, of the top of your deck or just be willing to roll with the RNG. And that's really hard for me to stomach, quite honestly, with a five mana potentially do nothing when it enters the battlefield. But the the it's the two, three option that's the important part. I think that, that we are definitely meant to set up the top of our deck and then cast the card and get the payoff. The problem is it's so face up, dude. It's a two, three that's sitting on the board and it attacks, does the scry, then bounces, then you replay it. So if the opponent has a counter, a removal spell of almost any size, like, and you don't get to your end step, it just doesn't happen. And I, that, it has me really wary that this card is going to be more feels bads than goods. Yeah, it's like, it reads like a sweet card, but it definitely doesn't read like a, just a solid player that you can count on in your deck. Do we ever, okay, maybe this is just something that Arjuna tries. Do we ever just play this and and Rada in the same deck? And so we're just always looking at the top of our deck and we just guarantee that hit. Do you, do you see what I'm go ahead. down there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, you did, right. it. I'm, did I, it. I, You did it. What a go curve, on. right? That's a 4-5 that's a curve if ever I've seen one. You played tur- You played <laughs> a flying 2-3 on turn 2 and a trained Armadon on turn 3, and you're playing standard. Have fun. Uh, someone's going to do it, man. That's all I'm going to say. I, I do think it, it is cool that you can play this as a 2-mana two 2-3, two, just chump with it, and then get it back later as mm-hmm. the other side with Elspeth Conquers Death. Mm-hmm. Two three flyer for two is 
a very solid body. So one of my questions is, you're playing against mono red, are you happy to have this in your deck? Um, I can be. Like, blocking Robber the Rich sounds fun. Uh, here's another kind of interesting thing with the card, and maybe you can figure out how to abuse this from your side of things, but if you play the 2-3 and they glass casket it, then you blow up the casket, you get the 5 mana, you get the front. Or they Skyclave Apparition it, and you kill the Apparition, you get a 5-5. Five five. Or for that matter, were, were you to, I don't know, blink this with Yorian? Would you also? Yeah, yeah. Th- I, I, I was hoping, I'm trying to think of a way that's cheaper, but yes, Yorian, of course, uh, pretty nice with this card. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's something to think about. Might be the way that this card becomes playable. Because I'll tell oh, you what. Oh, Maze Mind Tome. Maze Mind Tome. With the scrying. Yeah, you know the top card. Yep. So you hit. Hey, that yeah. could be enough, yeah. man. That could be enough. If this card draws you one card, and it's probably going to be like a 4-4 four, four or a 5-5 five, five or whatever anyway, that's pretty gas. All right. I might be better than I thought. Maybe. But we'll see. I think that you slash we are right, though, that like you really need to be able to count on the top of your deck. Another way you could abuse this is, I suppose, Omen of the Sea gives you that scry 2, right? So any effect that gives you scry 2 lets you, you know, like, because you're, you're going to... I guess you draw one card, though. Yeah, so at the end of your turn, you scry 2, you draw one, right? Then you mm-hmm. drop this, and you know what the next card is. So, yeah, yeah. that could be a thing. Varagoth, a blood sky, sire. Two and a black, two, three, legendary creature, demon, rogue at rare. Death touch. This creature has boast. So let's talk about the boast mechanic. It says, activate this ability only if this creature attacked this turn and only once each turn. So the creature with the ability itself has to have attacked. You can only do it once per turn, but my understanding is as soon as it's declared an attacker, you can do it at instant speed at any point after that happens for the rest of the turn. So the effect on this creature is boast, one and a black. Target player searches their library for a card, then shuffles their library and puts that card on top of it. So that's what, Vampiric Tutor, I think? Mm Mm-hmm. Which admittedly is a very powerful effect so i guess the question is are we willing to invest in a two three death touch for three in order to get it uh that's where i start becoming skeptical of this card i think pretty bad against things like basically any deal three in the format Uh, yeah yeah i okay the downside that you play this and it dies is pretty rough Let's, but let's talk about a situation where you play this, it doesn't die, and you get to attack, and it doesn't die in combat. So That's we get to put good. a card on top of our deck, and we probably have two other mana open. So say we have two mana open and a card of our choice on top of our library. What if you're rogues? And Because this is a rogue. Sorry, everybody oh, who hates it is rogues. A rogue. yeah. So what if you just fetch drown in the lock or into the story and you just do this for every turn for the rest of the game yeah that would be pretty gnarly i mean that's nasty right (laughs) and that's so nasty so here's one of the things i like about this is that you can attack with it and immediately activate boast so you can even if it doesn't survive combat you set up the top of your deck so that's pretty gas Yes, you can also wait and see what happens in combat before you boast, mm. so you know whether or not to set up another Vorogoth <laughs> or yeah. way to get Vargoth back, like call the Death Dweller, give it menace. Now it's I, I, and yeah, and it lets you run silver bullets, right? You, you can just run one call the Death Dweller and go boast for it if you want this back. Like, That's true. Pretty pretty good in any kind of combo situation. Doesn't seem bad. Doesn't seem bad. It doesn't seem doesn't amazing seem great. either. Yeah, this is one of those like high risk, high reward cards. Much so, better on the play than the draw, right? That's like much very better. True. That's very true. Also, a lot better against certain decks, right? So, like um, a decent card against a control deck because they just have to have it, right? And you're going to be playing some kind of threat anyway. So. I, I don't know. I'd probably rather have this against a slower deck than a faster deck, would be my estimation. Mm-hmm. 
Interesting. If your deck like has a plan, if you're not just like turning creatures sideways, but your deck actually has some kind of end game that you're moving towards, then I think this this card gets better because I, I yeah yeah I think it might be a really good tempo or control card because it it does seem like on turn three if the opponent can't navigate a way out and you just kill their blockers so it keeps attacking you can just draw a removal spell every turn for the rest of the game or a counter spell you know what this card reminds me of is the 2-2 flyer in Demir that draws you a card off of your opponent's deck Thief of Sanity? Yeah this is this is kind of a Thief of Sanity right it is a threat that you can play that if your opponent doesn't answer is just quickly going to win you the game yeah yeah you could get yeah, like oh it's so demoralizing too because the opponent doesn't know what you get but yeah <laughs> you just know it's bad for you <laughs> yeah whatever whatever they need right mm-hmm. do you ever target anyone else with the ability yes when this is your commander and you have opposition agent which in commander means that whenever a, an opponent would search their library you search it instead and you may cast the card that they search for yeah, or uh, uh, how about like when you have Tybalt on the field? Bam! I, I guess, yeah. <laughs> they, yeah, I guess they put the card on top of their library and then you exile it and now it's yours. You keep it now. Yeah, I mean, that's a nine mana play potentially without, in order for it to not be a face up thing, but you know, we're dreaming. <laughs> All right, CGB, a card I think you might be likely to try Alaron's Epiphany, read it for us. Alrun's Epiphany is a five blue blue sorcery that is mythic. You create two one one bird creature tokens with flying. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Take an extra turn after this one. Exile this card. Foretell four and a blue blue. So this is our foretell card, which means you may pay two and exile this card from your hand face down. Cast it on a later turn for the foretell cost and it's like you said it does say during your turn in the helpful reminder text Mm. so at some point earlier in the game you can pay two to exile this and then at some point you can have a six mana take an extra turn make two birds which is pretty powerful this is what i'm imagining is that you play this in your in a deck that i know that you would love to build with your enchantment that doubles your spells right in ch- oh double vision yeah double vision right so you go so you fo- how is this me <laughs> you're the you're the double vision mage on the podcast of course everyone knows it on turns one through four you foretell this card on turn five you double vision and then on six boom you cast this you get two extra turns you're probably going to win from there we broke it sure we did it <laughs> did i did you you did you forgot to mention the four birds you know well that's, that's what the I'm important saying. part yeah. I, I think the idea is that the birds are like giving you some kind of a, a kill condition going on. So one of the things that these decks typically do, like this was the um, the Nexus of Fate issue, is that you actually needed a win con when you ran that card. This does not suffer from that from that problem, right? The, the, what? This is that was infinite turns. This is this exiles <laughs> itself and its sorcery speed. This is not freaking Nexus of Fate. Oh, oh my God! Two birds. You're on a ten turn clock, and I get one of those turns for free. Hey, four birds, buddy. <laughs> all right, give me give me some credit here. All right, I, your double vision <laughs> your double vision plan didn't work. Just get over it. Oh, I I I don't believe in this card. Um, I think that this is I. First of all, I wish they just didn't make extra turn cards. Yeah, why do we why do we even need it? I know. We've got enough. Uh but somebody out there loves it, I guess. It's actually not me. I I think extra turn cards are kind of lame. Uh nobody wants to see that. And nobody lets you do it. On arena, everybody scoops. You never get to play your extra turns. So what's the point? Well, there you um, go, man. Six mana win the game. Boom. No, I no. The So the problem with the six mana part is you had to pay two mana earlier. And the problem with that is it's basically adding extra cost. It means that you're having a less mana efficient game, which means you're behind to begin with, which means that there's pressure on you to use the extra turn to get way ahead. So what do we do with our extra turn besides draw a card and attack with two birds? It's contextual. It depends on your deck. It depends on your cards. If you have a really good extra turn, it means you had really good cards anyway, which means you probably didn't need this. 
Yeah. Imagine if instead of taking an extra turn, you just, I don't know, cast a really impactful six drop. Like a dream trawler? Yeah. Yeah. Dream trawler tends to buy you extra turns anyway, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, so anything with extra turns, the key is to cheat. Yeah. You, you just have to cheat. You can't play fair. So maybe there's a way to cheat. Supposing we're cost reductioning this spell... And not just the foretell. I mean, additional things that make spells mm -hmm. cheaper mm -hmm. gets a lot better, right? Yes. So okay, like how good would this card be if you paid four mana for it? it would be kind of busted, wouldn't it? Yeah. Do you have an idea in mind for it? Do we have any spell reduction? I don't think we have any spell reduction in standard. Do we? Do you remember what Kaza does? I don't. No. Remind so, me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that haste wizard. Yes, yeah. Kaza is a blue and a red for a 1-2 flying haste, and the tap ability is that the next instant or sorcery you cast costs X less, where X is the number of wizards you control. Hey, man, I don't know. So if something. You, so if you have Kaza, and then you have the that playable two-drop two wizard, right? The red one? Magmatic Chandler. Magmatic Chandler, and you have the Kaza, and then already we're looking at and Alrun's Epiphany for four. Yeah, we're definitely looking for more wizards too. Uh, yeah. But I mean, that's a tribe that's everywhere. So yeah, like a, you've got to cheat. So get your big cheating brain on to make this card good. Yeah. Th so the problem with that is that you took an extra turn, but for what? So that you could just play more wizards. That's probably not strong enough. So I, I mean, what if there are good wizards? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But but I totally agree. Extra turns, ideally you want to have some kind of game winning combo or you want to assemble some kind of attack for lethal or you just you want to be able to lock out your opponent somehow. Again, standards not really probably giving us the tools to do that, but yeah, I don't know. Cards like this are very powerful, and so it's always good to look out for ways to abuse them. If we can cast this for free, if we can cast this with our Sertland Elementalist, Boom, now we're talking. How about the wizard that is Seagate Stormcaller, where if we kick it, it copies it three times. Oh, wait, that doesn't work because it's too expensive. But anyway. Oh, uh, I like the way you're thinking, though. It is a wizard. Hey, someone's going to try That's what we're it. looking for. Someone's yeah. going to try it. And then uh, get it to fairy down, and you can get some more ticks up, and then you... Anyway. All right, this next card is another extremely powerful card, um, which I think is quite interesting and definitely worth talking about. Vorinclex, Monstrous Raider, four green green for a 6-6 six, six legendary creature, Phyrexian Praetor at Mythic. So, first of all, this is like a flavor record scratch. Or, or what I mean is that Vorinclex being in this set is a little bit like when Emrakul appeared in uh, Innistrad, which is like some big stuff is about to go down in the magic story here. So... That's that's the first thing we need to pay attention to here. Okay, so 6-6, six, six, six mana, trample, haste. If you would put one or more counters on a permanent or player, put twice that many of each of those kinds of counters on that permanent or player instead. So it's basically like a doubling season. And then if an opponent would put one or more counters on a permanent or player, they put half that many of each of those kinds of counters on that permanent or player instead rounded down and that's that's a critical part of it here because if there's anything that's putting one counter on something it's not going to happen so that includes like planeswalkers it includes uh sagas random plus one plus one counters are just not going to happen <laughs> where to begin oh my gosh man yeah, can card. i just say something yeah. can we try to stick to standard because okay like there are so many things okay agreed yeah no you're right this this is definitely like people are going to be trying all kinds of nonsense in historic are they going to be building brawl decks with this or whatever this card just has implications all right so let's let's take it one step at a time all right this is basically like a reality smasher cost one more mana and is one more point of power and toughness some people don't know what reality that reality smasher is actually a card they might think this is a term you just use on a cool thing so yeah, Reality Smasher was uh, ended up being a very, very playable card, basically like a 5-5 five, five Trample Haste with an additional, I don't remember what the cost was to target it, but it was just like a 
kind of a hard to kill hasty trampling creature that has eaten a surprising amount of face during its tenure in magic. So big power haste tramplers are like pretty good, man. Okay, that, that if, mm -hmm. if you're gonna play a chonky creature, it may as well be massive how trample and haste. That's a good start. Let's talk right there. Okay, if that's where the card ended, so if we just have a big trampley chonker, probably not quite good enough for standard, right? Dies to heartless act. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, probably not good enough on its own. Not, it would need an ability of some kind. Thankfully, we have one. Exactly. So, so here's one of the things I love about Vorinclex, is that your opponent cannot use Elspeth Conquer's death to kill it. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, we, do we, do we dove right in. I, I was thinking, I have a sticky note of things with Vorinclex. I just wanted to like throw it at you, and yeah. then you can be like, does it work like that? Or how does it work? Okay, okay. <laughs> that, that's what I've got up my sleeve. And you dove like, you went right to one of the main courses. All right, so let's, let's start with your sticky then. All right, so let's start. Let's keep. Let's start simple. Yeah. If you play a Yorvo, and you control a Vorinclex, what do you have? So let's see. Yorvo starts at four four. So if you were to curve somehow, if you were to curve Yorvo into Vorinclex, you would end up with a six six. A six six. Yeah. Yeah. So if you would put one or more counters on a permanent or player, put twice that many of those kinds of counters. Yeah. So wouldn't that be an eight eight? No, because it's supposed to get one. Oh, you're talking about uh, Yorvo first. I'm sorry. Oh, although, actually, hold on. Does Yorvo say that you get two counters if the creature's bigger? It I might. believe so. It might. So I'm right either way. So I think you are right. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, CGB just did a big flex. No, you're right. So, yes, it would be an 8-8. All right, and you play another creature? If you play another creature and that creature is still bigger than Yorvo, then it gets four more. But if that creature is not Crazy. bigger than Yorvo, then it gets plus two, plus two. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Now say your opponent controls the Yorvo. So they play Yorvo when you already have Vorinclex in play? Exactly. Okay. So it gets half that many. So it's a 1-1? One, one? I think it comes in as a one-one, dude. It, it's a four-four, so it comes in as half. It, it comes in with half, so it's a two-two. Oh, I, but it's oh in the round down. Okay, yeah, that's right. Yep. The round down is yep. only a tiebreaker when it's auto. Okay, so it's a two-two. Right. Yep. Or like so the crisis, which I guess is historic, but the crisis comes yeah. in with half the counters. Yeah. So then they play another creature. What happens to their Yorvo? Nothing. Nothing, because it rounds down. But Unless it's bigger than the Yorvo. I well, I suppose yeah. it's bigger than the Yorvo, so then it gets plus one, plus one, right? Yorvo was a terrible example. I should have said Grokma. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is interesting, though, man, because you're right. But yeah, a Stone Coil Serpent would be another one where it's just like this. It's going to get it wacky. It gets half. Yeah, it yeah. Gets, it's absolutely wacky. So just in plus one, plus one counters on creatures, this card is silly yeah right so say if you control a great henge oh, your man. creatures get two counters yeah. and if your opponent controls a great henge they get none they get no counters yeah this this card's gonna have a surprising number of hosing applications what happens if you what happens if your opponent controls a maze mind tome while you have this card what what happens when they try to draw a card with it do they not get the card if it doesn't get the counter I'm not sure. <laughs> Dude, I Judge. think you might you might just infinite your opponent's maze mind tome. That could be a disaster. <laughs> I know. Um, another one that's fun is Crawling Barons. Yours gets oh, double, theirs gets single. That's nasty. That is nasty. Okay, okay. Let's get into... Um, oh, I want to do this one really Dude, quick. Dude, hold on. Abil you, okay. But you speed up your own maze mind tome, so don't play those in a deck with Vorin Clax, all right? Bad. That's right. You put two counters on it, but only draw one card. Bad combo. <laughs> I think. I think that's how yeah. it works. All right. Keep keep going. Your opponent controls Vivian, uh, the five mana monster's advocate. Yeah. They plus it to make the creature that either has the reach or the trample it or just the comes out as a vanilla. Has no has no ability yeah. counter. That's yeah. right. Gets None. wrecked. Zero. Taste it, Vivian. <laughs> you control the Ozolith with two oh, counters no. on it, and you control Vorinclex. <laughs> oh, no. 
<laughs> okay. This is like I I'm mean, glad Arena exists because I do not want to deal with that in paper, man. <laughs> all right. We're going to get into the really juicy ones. That wasn't the juicy one? <laughs> nope. Not no. Sagas. Yeah. So if you play a saga, what happens? So th that's really interesting, right? Because I think, does it skip a point on your saga or do you just get like two of them in the same turn? That's what I'm curious about. The overwhelming amount of people who have yelled at me about this say that you get both. Mm, you get both triggers. That's interesting. So Elspeth Conquers Death would exile a permanent and activate the tax on the same turn that you played. Nasty. Immediately. That's Immediately. Nasty. But that's I mean, that's nasty. Yeah. That's not half as nasty as what we're about to do. Okay. Because what happens when your opponent plays Elspeth Conquers Death? Dude, nothing happens is what happens. Nothing. Which is pretty awesome. Well, it's interesting because Elspeth Conquers Death stays on the battlefield. Indefinitely, yeah. It just sits there. Yeah. So when Vorinclex dies at the beginning of the next upkeep... They get an ECD. E it starts moving. Yeah. Yeah. It's so weird. Yeah, dude. To even think about. It's it's definitely going to mess up a lot of things. Is Planeswalkers the next one? Because It is. Okay. Because when I think about the truly busted things you could be doing, I feel like Planeswalkers have to feature in it, right? I mean, I imagine your, so. your plus two on your uh, Tybalt becomes a plus three. That's just insane. I I'm sorry, a plus three? Do you mean a plus four? Oh, it's a, it does doubles it? Is that right? Yes. Oh, my God. But let me ask you, how much loyalty does your Tybalt have when you play it? When you play it... So, okay, hold on. When you play a Planeswalker, you put counters on it, right? Yes. So does that mean that your Planeswalkers come... They just all come in with double loyalty? Judge needs to verify, but my understanding is yes. Oh, damn okay dude we like we're in a different universe now <laughs> how about the opponent's planeswalkers <laughs> they come in with half loyalty rounded down and and their plus ones do nothing nothing do they <laughs> and that and i think i'm pretty sure that planeswalker abilities they just can't be like they can't activate if they don't get the counter right i'm not sure judge but i believe because, like i've been told that's true because solemnity shuts down planeswalkers so so if they don't get a counter from activating then okay so here's the deal it would need to be at least a plus two i think to activate right yes okay i think so yeah so <laughs> basically we're playing like super friends with that big pal super pal boring clex is, is what i'm getting from this I mean, think about this. If the opponent has the Tybalt, which we just introduced, yeah. so it's kind of difficult to remember, but this is a five loyalty planeswalker with a minus three to exile target creature or artifact. It enters with two loyalty, if we understand this correctly, because of the Viren ability, which means it can't even minus three to kill it. Yeah, and it can only plus up to, you know, just one additional plus each turn. Ugin also comes down in ultimates immediately, if we understand this correctly. Yes. Draw 10, or draw 7, yeah. gain 7, put oh, 7 permanents my, onto the battlefield. Oh my good goshness. That's, that's this is really insane. something. This, this is the kind of card that has such an overreaching effect on the game that it actually opens the pathways of the mind to all the nonsense, and I love that. I also think that people are going to be screaming for this card to be banned. Yeah. I think they'll be screaming for it to be banned a lot sooner than it actually ought to be banned. However, if someone does assemble the right kinds of combos, this, okay, so this could end up being a, a agent of treachery. Everyone's like, oh, that's pretty good, but no one thinks it's just super busted, right? And then just over the course of the format, you're like, every deck that I hate seems to have a win con with this card in it, and then eventually it gets banned. So I feel like Vorinclex could end up being one of those kind of cards. I mean, you mentioned Agent of Treachery. The Transmogrify and Luca are lurking in the format. So if yeah. you put no other creatures in your deck and a bunch of sagas, yeah, like, this is... 
a scary card. Yeah, and like dropping and immediately ultimating basically any planeswalker is just not to be scoffed at, right? If we're correct about that ruling, I I, I can't stress this enough. Yeah. This is some primo content where no, we haven't researched everything. These cards just came out and people are gonna be yelling at us in comments for the next two months, and that's fine. Uh that's just the way it's gonna be. But uh for now it's fun to try to figure this out. I have a hard time imagining that Vorinclax isn't going to be a player in Standard at some point. Agreed. I mean, the flaw of a 6-6 Trample Haste, that's not a bad card. It's really not. I'm excited, slash a little bit nervous, slash I know I'm going to get completely demolished by this at least once at the at the pre-release event, so... <laughs> I mean, it sounds really silly, but I really believe that, like... It's going to be some kind of a Genesis ultimatum or, or emergent ultimatum deck featuring this because the immediate impact of this, especially if other things enter the battlefield the same turn, can be insane. That's it, man. See, that's that's the thing is that we've gotten to this point where there are enough cards in the format that either allow you to cheat stuff out or get stuff back. You know, I mean, yeah, like the ECD combo is just super gnarly, right? So it's basically like unless your opponent is specifically exiling this card or figuring out a way to not let it come down in the first place, it just could have very scary implications. Wow. All right. That's that's very, very exciting. It is. And uh, these next cards do not uh, carry that excitement. No, they don't. <laughs> However, some of them are, are pretty interesting in their own right. So I imagine, CGB, that you're probably going to be casting this card a decent amount. So be uh, read Behold the Multiverse for us. Behold the Multiverse is three and a blue instant. Scry two, then draw two cards. Foretell for two, or one and a blue. So... Again, you may play this for two mana on your turn, and later on, at some point in the game, at instant speed, you can pay one in a blue to cast Behold the Multiverse. You think I'm going to play this card? Dude, I easily could see you playing this card. Yeah. I don't think I'll ever cast this no, card. No, you don't think you're going to play this? I think it's too slow. Dude, okay, this, this is what I'm thinking about. Control decks often have things to do on turn two, but sometimes they don't. And I think that if you're foretelling this card and then at any other point in the game, you get to pay two mana to cast it. I think that's really strong, personally. All right, so CGB is not a buyer on this card. I, nope. I find this card to be quite compelling, personally. Maybe it's because I'm still stuck in the, like, scry two, draw two for four is a good card mindset, and maybe magic has moved beyond that. I definitely defer to your experience as a control mage, but I don't know, man. This, this card looks pretty good to me. I'd strongly prefer that you turned out to be right and I turned out to be wrong. I have a feeling that a fair amount of foretelling on turn two is going to be happening in this format. I just have an inkling. You mean, uh, I, I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. Hard to say. All right, read us Glimpse the Cosmos. This is one in a blue sorcery at Uncommon. Look at the top three of your library. Put one of them into your hand, the rest on the bottom. As long as you control a giant, you may cast Glimpse of the Cosmos from your graveyard by paying blue rather than paying its mana cost. If you would cast Glimpse of the Cosmos this way, and it would be put into your graveyard, exile it instead. Okay, so clearly the, the front half of the card, not good enough. But I feel like if you get to cast the back half of the card consistently, this card is very, very good. Give me eight good giants, and I'll think about it, but you like this better than the saga? That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that. I think the saga is significantly better, mm. which is why I'm surprised that you're interested in this card. Mm. Upon my initial reading of both of the cards, I think I was higher on this. Let me, let me just check in and see if I'm still higher on it. Yeah, like getting this effect twice is out of one card i think is very very strong it's hard if you if you're getting all of the parts of the buffalo on the other on the saga it's probably better but i think in your average giants deck glimpse of the cosmos is going to earn its place i think all right you you said if you're getting all the parts of the buffalo then the other one's probably better all it requires is one giant and that's all glimpse of the cosmos requires yes but <laughs> 
for the entire rest of the game, all you need is one giant to get your money's worth out of Glimpse, right? Whereas with the Saga, you need to have it really line up on all these specific turns. Glimpse helps you find the giant, right? So I don't know. I think in any blue giants deck, this just seems like an auto include to me. Saga helps you find the giant. <laughs> You look at just as many cards. I love how we're like still talking about that card. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I, just, I, I, I see how this happens. I just, it, I, I find it funny uh, comparing the two. Okay, CGB, would you rather draw one card from your card or two cards? What else happens? We're not talking about that, buddy. <laughs> Identical casting cost? No, this is cheaper, actually. Is it? Yeah. No, it's not. Well, okay. It's you, three mana if you you're going to draw two You pay three mana to draw two, whereas the other one is, is two mana to draw one. To scry two, draw one, deal two damage, and p get two mana. Yeah, but I, th I think that that's really best case scenario thinking. I think that you're going to pull off Glimpse of the Cosmos like almost every time you play the card, whereas I don't think that you're going to do that with the Saga. Okay. Yeah. I, clearly, I'm higher on this card than you are, but I don't know. I think in a in a blue deck that runs any number of giants, I just don't see why you wouldn't play this card. The the giant fanboys in the ch in comments are just saying, "Run both! Just just <laughs> dirt till go. infinity! Just, just run both!" I, okay. This is what I'm curious about, CGB. I'm curious if we're just not gonna get any cheap giants, and so if they're just like trying to give us incentive to play stuff on turn two as a result that isn't a giant. Changelings, I guess. Maybe. Hard for me to imagine running the full eight, right? Both both of the saga and this, but really interested, really interested to see if the blue and especially the blue red giants deck is like a deck. Because I could easily see it being like a limited deck and not really showing up in standard, but sometimes they give us enough. The only blue giant we've seen so far is terrible. We have to have some frost giant type things, though. Yeah. It's called Heim, you know? It's Norse. So that's what I'm talking about. If they print a six mana, like, mythic, just freeze your head off giant, and then you get to play it off of the saga, now we're talking, man. Uh, just give me a four mana, three, four, that draws a card and scries two when it enters the battlefield, you know? Maybe give it flash. <laughs> I'll be watching your channel on release day, man. Next up... We have cards which, eh, who knows whether they're going to see play in Constructed, but they're worth talking about. So we have these tap lands, they are dual lands, they are snow lands, and um, interestingly, they have the types. So, I'll give you an example. Arctic Treeline is a snow land, it is a forest plains, it taps to add green or white, and it enters the battlefield tapped. Clearly the the thing here again is that you want to be playing a snow deck that has enough snow payoffs that you feel incentivized to play this. So I fully expect these to be showing up all over the place in Limited. They're probably going to be decent picks in Limited. How good would a snow deck have to be for you to want to play these in Constructed CGB? I need something. Um, we, we saw that the Saga fetches a forest, mm -hmm. so it could fetch one of these, but I would need something probably cheaper than that so that it made it worth having some tap lands in your deck that you can manifest fit fix like if we had far seek in the format i'd run a few of these but then again there are triumphs so if your color has a triumph you don't need it i yeah. i don't think i don't think so but i what the weird thing is i still want full arts because these arts are freaking awesome they are incredible aren't they yeah i am of the north i am a child of of the northern part of the country i am a sucker for majestic sceneries covered in snow and this oh my gosh it, it's really nice i want full arts of these really bad look at that glacial floodplain is that just not a super beautiful land i was looking at the arctic tree line man. yeah i mean that's got the aurora, the aurora Borealis Borealis. happening there yeah these these are really gorgeous so. that swamp th that island swamp what the hell am i looking at but it's awesome it's a tunnel dude it's an ice tunnel an ice tunnel are you kidding me? That's awesome. That's amazing. Dude, yeah, no, that for sure. These these all look fantastic. Ah, uh, I feel so torn, right? Because I kind of hate snow, but these lands are making me want to play it. So we'll see. We'll see. But know that these are in the format. Next, we have one of CGB's favorite cards in the set, Reflections of Lit Jara. Why don't you read this for us, CGB? Four and a blue enchantment. 
When Reflections of Litjara enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Whenever you cast a spell of the chosen type, copy that spell. Dude, this goes straight into your spell doubling deck. You have a creature doubler and a spell doubler, right? No. What could be better? No. I, <laughs> I this this card is this card is cool. And it's not for the spiky spikes unless something really insane happens. So can you sell me on the creature type that we're naming and copying? Uh, that just has this doing everything. Because I'll tell you right now, Historic Commander Brawl, Risen Reef, Elementals are insane with this card. Yeah. But yeah. But what do we do in standard? We, yeah, man. I unfortunately like we do need some kind of kiki jiki combo to abuse a card like this. That's a boomer reference, but it's basically creatures that have an ETB that let you continue going off with them. If you have a creature which when it enters the battlefield copies some effect, for example, you might be able to assemble some kind of pretty nasty combo with this card. So I feel like we're probably playing this in a combo deck or not at all. It's kind of my thought on it. One of the issues with creature tribal decks is that they're usually trying to end the game around like turn the turn that you would cast this card. So a lot of creature tribal decks are trying to like get down some cheap stuff in the first turns, play a couple of heavy hitting kind of mid-rangey lords or kind of something that makes your existing stuff a lot better, and then just try to end the game pretty shortly thereafter. And so this card's not really on that plan at all. But maybe there's like a, the turn following you play this, you just have like this, some insane going off scenario where you kind of effectively win the game from that point. Yeah, I, I feel like Elementals is the card that where this might have had a chance because they kind of transcended that tribal thing that you talked about, the typical tribal play pattern where they had a ton of value and they snowballed off each other and there were small ones and large ones mm. they also ramped so yeah that, that that that's nice i mean do we have that are we going to play this in elves yeah elves is the most likely place <sighs> interesting yeah so this card does look mostly like a janky build around to me i'm just gonna name bird okay and i'm gonna i'm gonna play yorian <laughs> and i'm gonna yes. double blink everything it's not even particularly good because your first Yorian blinks out everything, then the second Yorian Does comes nothing. down and there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. Sequencing CGB. It's stri strictly bad. It's all about sequencing. <laughs> okay, this next card uh, I think has many, many implications and is very interesting. Why don't you read it for us, CGB? This is Goldspan Dragon. It's three red, red creature dragon, mythic, four, four, flying haste. And whenever Goldspan Dragon attacks or becomes the target of a spell, create a treasure token. Treasures you control have tap, sacrifice this artifact, add two mana of any one color. Oof, I'm getting feelings, man. You're, you're having treasury feelings? I'm, I'm having some glittery golden feelings about this card. Mm, it, it is something. All right, so... First off, if you have any treasures already in play when you drop the dragon, you essentially double their ability to add mana. Let's remember that treasures add two mana of any color, right? So if you have any kind of protection, let's say counter spells or stuff like that, you essentially will immediately have it up for the gold span dragon. Counter dragon. Nice. Yeah, dude, counter dragons. It's a new You archetype. just have negate. It creates mana for its own negate. Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. And oh, then... by the... oh, and it's targeted. When it's targeted by the spell, you make the token. So if they target it, you make the treasure and can negate. That's what I'm saying, spell. man. So Ooh. like if this if this thing resolves, your opponent might just be in a world of trouble. That's some ifs, right? The rest of the shell needs to be good. But in a treasury deck like this is exactly the kind of card that we we're wanting to see show up for our magda deck mm -hmm. i could easily see some kind of treasure dragons archetype forming and if that happens i just think this card has to be a player in it 
I think so, and especially with Magda and the ability to sack treasures to go fetch the dragon, you can just like run a one of, although I don't even know if that's right, because you just make more treasures to fetch more of them, so why not? Yeah, uh, and remember cow. like this this deck that we're talking about theoretically already runs a number of creatures that are kind of banking on that when this attacks create a treasure synergy. Mm -hmm. So I just have a feeling that a of all, we have a lot of options mid combat. Like, think about how easily this thing lets you cast Ember Cleave, even though you just tapped five mana on turn five. You could still like if you if you had some other treasures in play and any other creatures in play, you could just like tap out and cast Ember Cleave that turn. That's true, but I hate it. So <laughs> let me let me pitch something I don't hate. The, turn if, if you play this and attack with it, then untap with it and hit make your land drop. You can cast Tybalt. Dude, that's what I'm talking about, man. Boom. I think if there's basically any other playable treasure cards in the set, along with this and Magda, like, this card's starting to look very good to me. Yeah, this card is probably good. Mm -hmm. Assuming what we can tell from the direction the set seems to be going. It feels like this should be good. Yep. And definitely kind of you've been hinting at it before as well but like big red decks are looking pretty good in this format so uh -huh. i think we're yeah. gonna start to see some yeah that archetype's gonna get some boosts for sure contrary to popular opinion i actually enjoy big red it's just rarely good and rarely playable oh i believe that i've I feel like you really enjoy red if you get to do things other than, you know, turn one, attack you, turn two, attack you. I've, I've, yep. I've seen those decks. I've watched CGB, tap a mountain. Yeah. Big red Yorian, baby. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, um, this card just has a lot of implications. Uh, don't sleep on it. I, it's just very easy for me to see this card being playable. It's also very easy for me to see this just being a staple of the format. This is one of those cards that like might end up just being one of these super versatile players that ends up showing up in a lot of different places. All right. Well, I think that's going to bring us to the end of the cards we wanted to talk about today. We have not read all of the cards that have been spoiled so far, but, you know, that's kind of a good... This is a good start, I would say, to the spoiler season. Really, there's so much going on with some of these. Do you have, from today's show, a card of the day? Ugh, that's tough. That is tough. Goldspan Dragon is definitely has to be one of them. Okay, okay, but I'm asking you for one. The one. The one. Uh, the one in today's show. Pick one. Oh, I like Tybalt. I really want Tybalt to be good. Likewise. Uh, so <laughs> I would have I would have picked Tybalt if you hadn't. I will pick the card whose name is pretty tough and very Phyrexian, but the Praetor. Oh, the Vorinclex, yeah. Yep, I will pick the Vorinclex. I feel like one of those two has to end up being a powerhouse, right? I think both of those are power powerhouses. I've been wrong before, but that's where I'm starting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there. Are, yeah, there are just some very, very strong cards in this set. Uh, I don't. I don't think we're going to struggle to see this set being played in standard. And we're only 96 cards in, man. We got a long way to go. Indeed, indeed. So. We have a lot to look forward to. So if you're if you're kind of not familiar with the show, maybe if you come to the show in recent months, you have a lot to look forward to. Covert Go Blue and I will continue to do this semi-exhaustive constructed set review for the set and try to read every card that we think might be playable or at least deserves conversation in standard and other constructed formats. Yeah, we're probably going to be releasing more content than we usually do in the coming weeks, so... Keep an ear out for that. Another thing I wanted to mention was uh, I wanted to give a big shout out to listener of the show and generous community member Bottle Brush Games. This is someone who has been watching our content on YouTube and an active member of our community who generously offered to edit the video for these uh, preview shows for YouTube and put in the card images. So, for all of you who are watching this, I know, I know, CGB's aghast with excitement around this. But literally, this is no joke, 
every single time we have released an episode on YouTube where we talk about previewed cards, we always get comments from people in the community saying, where are the pictures? I'd really love to see the pictures. Wouldn't it be cool if we could look at the pictures? I totally agree. And it takes the work of a skilled video editor who is willing to put in the time. And that, my friends, is Bottle Brush Games. So next time you see them, thank them profusely. They are really doing a solid to our community. And, uh, you know, go check them out. Follow them on YouTube, support whatever it is that they're up to, because what a cool thing. The hero we don't deserve. I, I <laughs> couldn't agree more. <laughs> so thank you, Bottle Brush. You are a true champion. All right, uh, you can find Arena Craft, of course, on YouTube. You can find us on Spotify. You can find us all of the usual places that you find podcasts as well. You can find Covert Go Blue on YouTube as well. Congratulations for recently hitting that 100k mark. We're all very proud of you. You can also find CGB streaming live during the week on Twitch. And CGB, I am stoked to talk with you next week about many, many more Kaldheim cards. Really excited to argue with you next week about giant tribal sorceries and enchantments. <laughs> I'm going to put in the bone crusher sound here. <laughs> no, I think you did it perfect. All right, man. <laughs> Catch you later. Later. <laughs>